Good day, everyone. I will, would like to welcome you to this teach-in, everything you need to know about the National Infrastructure Bank being hosted by the Coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank. I'm Carolyn Barcliff. I'm your moderator. I'm a grassroots organizer and founder of Build Back Better USA, and we support this coalition and the bill that they are advancing. There have been many resolutions and um, news articles that have been posted recently, including um, in my state of Washington state, a Senate joint memorial, also known as the resolution, is in the Senate and, and it just passed out of committee. It's now on to another committee. It's working its way through. Also in the New Jersey Assembly, the uh, New Mexico legislature, their Senate, uh, also, the Missouri House of Representatives and a resolution from the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. This resolution is endorsed by the women of the Salish Sea. Also, you may have seen um, an article posted to USA Today. Pennsylvania has established their own group. Um, a coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank in Pennsylvania. Your speakers today will be Alfeka Mutardi, a macroeconomist, former senior economist, International uh, Monetary Fund. Next, we'll hear from Stephen Fenberg, the award-winning author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism, and the Common Good. He's also an Emmy-winning producer. We will hear from Mary Jane Shimsky, the Westchester County Board of Legislators in New York. Also Representative Eddie Day Pashinsky from Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, former assistant speaker to the New York State Assembly. Also Representative Alan Green, MBA, former member of Missouri House of Representatives. Uh, Scott Coons, Executive Director, North Central Florida Regional Planning Commission. And again, I am Carolyn Barcliff, the founder and organizer for Build Back Better USA. And I wanna take just a moment to um, share with you uh, why I think this bill is vitally important and what appeals to me as a grassroots organizer, um, which includes the fact that this does not require this bank will not require going to Congress every year and asking for money. It'll be self-fulfilling. Uh, and it also is not a temporary na um, national bank as we've had before in our history. It will be a permanent one. It will help to fill some of the gaps that we know are not filled by the infrastructure bill that passed Congress, nor will it uh, fill everything that's left. Um, the Build Back Better won't fulfill all the extra needs that we have either. So this is a very timely issue. So I'd like to start with calling on El Feca Mutardi. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, and welcome to everybody. And thank you for joining us on this uh, day of action where we're going to learn everything you need to know about the National Infrastructure Bank proposal. And uh, what I'd like to do in my little uh, summary talk, especially for those of you who have not uh, seen our presentation on how the bank works is to explain how this National Infrastructure Bank works and why, as Carolyn says, it's an ideal platform for financing everything without any need to go to Congress every year to ask for money. Uh, the, the bank is embodied in a piece of legislation in the House of Representatives, H.R. 3339, which would create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And the reason we need such a bank is we simply are not able to finance infrastructure in the United States or any other country, as a matter of fact, either through the federal budget, through state and local budgets. The proof of the pudding is that our, fin our financing uh, investments have fallen way off from 4% of GDP in the 1960s down to 2.4% today. And even though we've had a, an infrastructure bill passed uh, through the budget for uh, to spend money from the budget, it's not going to be large enough as I'll show you in just a moment. So this idea of a public bank to finance infrastructure is not a new idea. We've had four really large banks in our nation's past uh, after the American Revolutionary War, around the War of 1812, a set of banks under Lincoln, and then the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, 
uh, which helped us to get out of the Great Depression and win World War II. And Stephen Fenberg in just a minute is gonna explain a lot more uh, about the details about that, how that bank worked. So this fifth proposal for a national infrastructure bank is modeled on the earlier four. Instead of going to the budget and asking for money to get this bank started, instead we go to the private sector who are holding US treasuries for long-term savings purposes and ask them whether they like to sell in about $500 billion worth, slowly over time as the size of the bank builds up in exchange for an equivalent of preferred stock in the NIB. And this preferred stock would pay these investors an extra 2% more than they're currently earning on their treasuries. And that 2% interest stream would come out of the interest earnings from the NIB's loans with plenty of money left over to meet opera, other operational needs of the bank. So that fully capitalizes the bank. That's what you need to do to uh, open a bank like this. That's step one. Step two is to actually give out a loan. And that loan process works exactly like a commercial bank. The NIB takes and deposits, creates money each time it gives out a loan. These loans would probably go to state and local governments, transit authorities, anybody that owns public infrastructure. And the loan terms would be very advantageous, keep financing costs down uh, around the treasury bond rate for interest charged and flexible repayment terms as well. Uh, this is the uh, what the bank would cover, excuse me, five trillion in projects, as I mentioned. Uh, where did this estimation come from? About half of it came from the American Society of Civil Engineers, who in 17 categories of hard infrastructure say that's how much we need to repair our transportation systems, our water systems, and upgrade our electric power grid. In addition, we added some categories we think are really highly critical, a complete high-speed rail network all across the country, broadband everywhere, affordable housing, 7 million units are factored into our bank's financing and large scale water projects to address drought in the Southwest where we grow about half of our nation's food. This is the same $5 trillion expressed in billions of dollars so that we can compare it to the, the bill that just passed in Congress in mid November and was signed into law, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that will provide only $550 billion of new money you can see that it's one tenth too small. And what it means is that every state in the country will not be able to receive everything that it needs for roads and bridges, mass transit falls way short on water infrastructure. Not enough, for example, to replace all of those lead service lines, which is a big emphasis of our bank. Nothing in here at all for high speed rail or affordable housing. We're very glad that the administration passed this bank, this bill. We always want state and local governments to receive grant money first, although they'll have to come up with their 20% copay uh, to uh, actually uh, uh, capture this money. But we, if we're really serious about fixing infrastructure and not continuing to degrade uh, our economy, then we were going to need a national infrastructure bank to top everything up. So finally, uh, this is what the bank would do to the American economy. And since I'm a macro economist, um, I, I look at these things because they're very important for restructuring and transforming our American economy. First of all, the operations of the bank will create up to 25 million new great paying jobs. The legislation requires that workers working uh, um, in, as for contractors or subcontractors must be paid Davis-Bacon wages. And of course, they'll get full benefits. A Buy America only provision for the in construction inputs means we'll be promoting American manufacturing. For example, you can envisage all those um, all the steel that will go into buildings and railroads and steel cars uh, could be made. All of that could be made in the United States. Uh, we think that this will accentuate uh, the average great growth rate of our economy, get it up to around five percent a year. That's where it was the last time we had a bank like this and increase productivity. So keep in mind, we're now able to finance everything we need without any new federal taxes or debt and without stoking inflation because this kind of investment is much more productive for the economy. So businesses will grow, workers will benefit, will reduce poverty and income inequality, which another speaker is gonna talk about, uh, rural and urban, uh, every single area in the United States will receive benefits from the bank and federal and state and local finances will improve. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Olfeka. It's always informative listening to you. 
Uh, next, I'd like to call on Steve Benberg, the award-winning author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism, and the Common Good. Thank you. Take it I away. I'm particularly touched to talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, there were 17 nations whose military was larger than the United States. We were completely unprepared. But within nine months, Congress passed legislation that enabled the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the nation's vital infrastructure bank, to begin building, buying, and converting plants and to start accumulating strategic materials and minerals from throughout the world to increase the nation's armed might. So 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation began building the massive factories that would manufacture the tanks, the trucks, the ships, the armaments that were required to fight and win World War II. And its efforts were comprehensive and unified. It created or orchestrated the creation of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production, just as the Japanese took the supply of natural rubber in the Pacific Ocean. The RFC cornered the market on wool and silk for uniforms and parachutes. It produced high octane gas to fuel the tens of thousands of airplanes it was building. And it built schools to train aviators to fly them. Everything they did was unified. They had an idea, they could see the whole picture. And I can't help but think that the strategies that the RFC used during World War II, when it went from 17th in size from military to the number one superpower, that those same strategies can be applied today to address the pandemic, climate change, the shortage of supply of materials for our economy and safety equipment to protect our citizens. The, ironically, the RFC was the New Deal's first alphabet agency and it was started by Republican President Herbert Hoover who had relied primarily on proclamations that the economy was sound, the depression was ending, everything will be fine. But during his last year in office, he realized he had to turn to the federal government, the power of the government to reverse the catastrophe of the Great Depression. So in 1932, he started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to pay loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads to save them, and also to save the economy and restore the public's confidence. And by the time he left office, he had increased the RFC's lending power to almost the entire size of the federal budget, which was about $4 billion back then, or not quite $80 billion today. Nonetheless, uh, one of its original board members, Jesse Jones, uh, who I wrote the biography about, would say, and it's very relevant today as we grapple with the size of government and the role of government, he said if Hoover had started the RFC a year earlier and had judiciously loaned five to seven billion dollars, the worst of the Great Depression would have been avoided. President Roosevelt inherited the RFC and Jesse Jones from Herbert Hoover and he supercharged it. Now it's important to realize 25% unemployment when Roosevelt became president. All the banks were closed. The economy had completely collapsed and suicide rates had tripled. It was, it was a devastating time. So Jesse Jones and uh, Roosevelt supercharged the RFC and they began making loans because the banks wouldn't let go of their money. Once they reopened, they were shell-shocked and they held on to their money. So they knew they had to get the wheels of the economy turning again with credit. So the RFC stepped in as the lender of last resort and it saved homes, farms, banks, businesses. It saved the railroads by refinancing their debt. Again, a strategy that can be used today instead of taxpayer bailouts for airlines and cruise lines and restaurants and art organizations, 
the, the new infrastructure bank can make loans just like the RFC did. The RFC brought electricity to rural Americans when 90% of the people lived in the dark, and then it sold them appliances on credit so they could plug into the modern age. Again, another strategy that can be used today to help people retrofit their homes so that they're storm resistant, energy efficient, and wired for the digital age. Um, the uh, notably, just as Alfeca was saying about not needing to go to Congress for new taxes or new debts, the RFC pretty miraculously, really, when you think about it during the Great Depression, made money for the taxpayer on these loans. They were all repaid to the United States Treasury plus a little bit of interest. So a new infrastructure bank, just like the uh, RFC, can do many things. It can fill the gaps that are missing from the new bills that have been passed and revitalize our nation and help the world at the same time, just like the RFC did before. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, truly appreciate all of your insight and knowledge. Uh, next, I'd like to bring um, up Mary Jane Shimsky from the Westchester County Board of Legislators in New York. Welcome, Mary Jane. Uh, thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, it's great to be here with so many of you from all over the country today. Um, New York, of course, is in the northeastern part of the country, and the northeast is where we have most of our oldest infrastructure. So looking at it as an official from New York, we have vast need. Um, for example, throughout the state, we have close to 2,500 bridges that need, we need to start repairing today. As we go further upstate into the rural parts of upstate New York, the numbers, the numbers get worse. Our roads are in bad shape. Anyone who spent much time driving in New York knows that. 11% of our rolling mass transit stock, bridges, railroad cars, and so on, need replacement today. We have lots of lead pipes like everybody else. Um, one of the big hidden expenses which can bankrupt a local government is sewers. And we are already starting to see some awful problems in some of our cities, and it's only bound to get worse with time. Um, I can go on. Climate change was brought up. We are going to have to invest billions of dollars over the course of the next 10 years to make ourselves more resilient to the more severe storms that are coming as a result of climate change. High speed rail will help reduce demand for cars. EV charging stations will help reduce demand for cars that burn fossil fuels. Electricity, our electrical distribution system, as well as our power grid needs massive investment, as does broadband. We talk about how upstate New York has serious economic problems. If everyone had broadband access, all those call center jobs can go to upstate New York, but we need to invest in our infrastructure to do it. Of course, we also have the need for hundreds of thousands of units of new affordable housing. We have school problems, not just lead pipes, but our facilities need serious repairs and in many cases upgrades. So when I look at a figure like the one that came out of the quote unquote bipartisan infrastructure bill that added $572 million in new spending, I look at that and I say, well, that will satisfy most of New York's needs. What's the rest of the country supposed to do? You go to the, to the Society of Civil Engineers, they're talking about $6 trillion to repair our infrastructure. Over half of that is money that is nowhere appropriated at this point. So you could see just from that numerical comparison, we need a lot more investment than we are going to be able to get from the appropriations process, which is why this bank is so critical to help all of our local governments and all of our regions thrive in the 21st century. So thank you very much. And I know we have other 
local and state officials on who will be able to talk about their stories as well. Um, it's the way we get stuff fixed to move our people forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to call Representative Eddie Day Pashinsky from the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Also, I would like to note, uh, if you drop your questions in the chat at the end of the presentations, we will have a question and answer period. Thank you. Representative. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's indeed a pleasure once again to be with so many wonderful folks that are working tirelessly to try to get this idea up and running for the future of America. I, I was approached about three years ago with Stu and Angela and their team, and they started talking about trillions of dollars. And three years ago, the word trillion just didn't exist. And I couldn't imagine how in heaven's name we are gonna get trillions of dollars in order to make this happen. Today, the word trillion or trillions is a common word, and it's quite evident that uh, those are the kinds of dollars that we need to move uh, America forward. Look, uh, I know that for uh, first time listeners, this may seem like an overwhelming project. The bottom line is it has been accomplished at least four times in our history. Of course, with Roosevelt, Hoover and, and uh, Lincoln. And this, if there was ever a time for a project to bring us together as Americans, there's such political aminous in, in, uh, in Washington. There's such division. Um, there is no cooperation. And this project could bring us together. Not only the 25 million jobs, the high paying jobs, not just the fact that we would be able to connect the broadband in Pennsylvania. We have over a million citizens in Pennsylvania that cannot connect, whether it's telehealth, whether it's education, or just strictly business or robotics. It's suppressing our progress. This project here, if there was ever a time for this to take place, it is now. And my goal here is not just to talk about the infrastructure, but to talk about the fact of what Carolyn said earlier. It's no taxes on the consumer. And it does not mean that you have to go back to to the Congress every time you need money to build something. This has proven itself time and time again. This is a time for us to come together as Americans. This isn't a Democrat issue, a Republican issue, independent. This is an American issue. This is how we catapult America into the 21st century. I'm so pleased to be a part of it. Pennsylvania, we just put up a Facebook page we are now trying to get out to the public. So the public now has to put the pressure on our congressmen and our senators. So they then pass House Resolution 3339. That's what we have to do. Let's all come together on this. I'm excited and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pashinsky. I, I love your enthusiasm. We need, we need a bit more of that this morning. Uh, next, I'd like to um, introduce Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, former Assistant Speaker of the New York State Assembly. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm so proud about today uh, calling a day of action uh, throughout the country, because this day today is going to really bring us more close together, especially when we have so many other people uh, that are joining us uh, throughout the country. And also, I would like to mention that we have been joined by uh, Representative Eddie Charbonnier from Puerto Rico. He's also in this call, in this Zoom that we are heading today. First time that we have Puerto Rico participation. And this is uh, very critical uh, for every state as well for every single territory. And it's important because we all have a lot of needs. We all have, like was mentioned before, we do need better roads, better bridges, very broadband, very affordable housing. And we also need better jobs and jobs that are real, not jobs that are just a rubber stamp, real jobs where people can be sustainable and they can move forward, their families and their, uh, and their, and their our economy. So it's very critical today that as we all are here, that we take the moment to, to hashtag every single member of Congress, every single member of the U.S. Senate, 
because they are the one that we need them to listen to us. And this is also a call for every state legislator from the assembly, the Senate, uh, city councils, uh, county exec members, and every single one of those folks who has been elected throughout the country and throughout the territory to do exactly what we've been doing, to hashtag their representative, their US senator, their governor. We need to involve their governor to be part of this. They come to, they go to Washington to bring their own agenda. So we all here for one reason and one reason only is to make sure that we bring this issue to the interests and the minds and the agenda of our US congressman and our US senator representative as well. So thank you for a wonderful day. I'm very proud, I'm very happy because uh, Stuart came to me four years ago when I was in the assembly and I was the first legislator to introduce the first resolution uh, throughout the country calling on Congress to act. And lastly, I would like to say that in 2000, uh, when we're talking about trillions of dollars, in the year 2000, when I was the chairman of the city's committee, I introduced a resolution calling on a municipal bond act of $2 billion to deal with sewers problem in the state of New York. That was then $2 billion. Today, the governor in the state of the state is calling for $4 billion. And with still, $4 billion is a short change when you, we look about all the needs throughout our state and our country. Again, thank you. Thank you for participating and thank you for joining us. And I cannot be more proud today to be part of this National Infrastructure Banking. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Truly appreciate your perspective and welcome to Puerto Rico. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Representative Alan Green, MBA, former member of the Missouri House of Representatives. First of all, I wanna say uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about this particular uh, House resolution. Uh, 3339 uh, is exciting, actually. The National Infrastructure Bank, NIB, is a, uh, will be a public uh, banking solution to provide adequate resources for infrastructure at the federal level. The NIB is modeled after FDR's Reconstruction Finance Corporation and can provide up to $5 trillion as much needed financing capacity for infrastructure. State of Missouri is a very conservative state, and that's what I'm speaking from here, from my experiences. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, we're getting a House resolution uh, proposed, uh, and that was issued uh, this week from the Missouri House. We've been also talking to the Missouri Senate and trying to get them on board. Uh, next Tuesday, St. Louis County, which is the largest county in the state of Missouri, We'll be offering this resolution uh, next Tuesday uh, evening. So things are moving here. I'm proud to say that. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, one of the things that I want to offer too is over the years, I've had an opportunity and the different committees and the different uh, things that I've done in government to look at tow roads, uh, gas tax, different uh, financing opportunities or how you bring public private partnerships to pay for the infrastructure in the state of Missouri but we were running 25 years behind here in the state of Missouri. So one of the things that I would like to recommend on this particular day too, is read the bill. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, read the bill, uh, House Resolution 339, get prepared by reading the bill. So you're gathering all that information and so you can answer questions and ask questions and be proactive. One of the things, again, when we talk about the national infrastructure, uh, bank. It will help disadvantaged neighborhoods and businesses, which is very, very important to me. And so I just wanted to say some things about, again, uh, in that particular bill, uh, it defines a disadvantaged community as one with relatively low medium household income. And it works off of uh, Jim Clyburn's 1023 formula that captures significant poverty in the rural South. Then it's another point. It allows interest rates and subsidies for low uh, interest uh, loans uh, in various areas. It also establishes a preference for projects in disadvantaged areas and those with high unemployment and stress uh, when we talk about stressed out workforces. It also establishes a preference for completion of broadband and wireless access and rules in disadvantaged communities. It also looks at, again, the Section 8 requires two directors on the board of the and minority disadvantaged 
uh, communities to be on this infrastructure uh, bank. Also, it looks at and it ensures that non-discrimination and participation of minorities, women, disadvantaged business enterprises are key components of this legislation that we're talking about. And it also goes back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with Small Business Administration rules to set aside 10% of loans in favor of minorities, women, disadvantaged business enterprises, which is DBEs. And so I looked at that and then last thing was requires rural infrastructure. We're talking about broadband now. We're talking about helping with the finance of rural in the rural area, which again is a low income and can be disadvantaged. So these are the kind of things that the reason I'm sitting here saying that this would be a great thing for our nation. Yes, we passed the infrastructure policy today, but it doesn't cover but 10%. So we need to cover the rest of the country. And I thank you and looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, sir. Um, next, I'd like to call on Scott Coons, the executive director for the North Central Florida Regional Planning Commission. Thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be with you. I'm the executive director of the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. We are an association of cities and counties uh, across North Florida made up of county commissioners and city commissioners. Uh, our board adopted a resolution supporting House Resolution 3339 last year. And I also had the opportunity the past uh, few years ago to serve as the president of the National Association of Development Organizations. This is a nationwide organization made up of 540 regional development organizations similar to the Regional Planning Council here in Gainesville, Florida, across the country that promotes regional strategies, partnerships, and solutions to strengthen economic competitiveness of our communities and a quality of life uh, across our country. Many of those organizations are economic development districts and have regional comprehensive economic development strategies. And all of those uh, focus as one of their key pillars, infrastructure as the basis for uh, economic development and job creation. And I'm pleased to report that the 60 member board of directors of the National Association of Development Organizations recently endorsed the establishment of the National Infrastructure Bank to help meet the financing needs for infrastructure. Since the beginning of civilization and the agricultural economy through the industrial revolution and today through the information innovation revolution, infrastructure has been the key critical component to economic competitiveness and prosperity of regional and national economies. Through the research of the World Bank, they identified several factors that influence economic growth and effectiveness. They include uh, in institutions, infrastructure, macroeconomic environment, health, primary education, technological readiness, and markets. Infrastructure includes roads, water, sewer, rail, and today, most importantly, broadband. Without these, we cannot uh, grow our regional and national economy. And in addition to infrastructure, there are now two associated uh, components to economic development and competitiveness that being talent supply or a skilled workforce in order to meet the needs of our changing economy. And associated with that is the need for affordable housing. Many employers are finding it difficult to find talented, skilled workforce that can afford to live in their communities. Now we're talking about uh, affordable workforce housing for teachers, for firefighters, for nurses, for police officers, and other essential first line workers. And the National Infrastructure Bank would also now include funding for affordable housing. Infrastructure is an essential requirement for regional and national commerce for growing widely shared prosperity, even as changes drive infrastructure requirements. Efficient investment in cutting edge infrastructure connects businesses and workers to opportunities, increases productivity, and strengthens American competitiveness. Continued delays in infrastructure investment have increased the urgency to address upgrading and modernizing our infrastructure in the United States. Current estimates indicated that this deferred maintenance has resulted in an additional $1 trillion price tag in needs for infrastructure in our country. Most infrastructure in the United States funding comes from state and local governments, uh, with some federal investment provided through 
grants, loans, and tax preferences to develop regional economies. In particular, counties, county government, your local county government owns and operates 44% of all roads in the country, 38% of all bridges, 78% of public transit, 34% of airports. And each year, those counties invest in maintaining and upgrading that infrastructure $134 billion across the country in local funds. The bipartisan infrastructure bill recently passed that several previous speakers alluded to uh, is much welcomed and needed. However, it is just a down payment on the $5 trillion need. There's only a little over $500 billion of new money, and that's over the next five years. So we're only going to have available 100 to 110, 114 billion dollars in new money each year for the next five years. According to the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis data, the average investment in non-defense public infrastructure has fallen from 4% gross domestic product in the 1960s to just over 2.5% in the 2010s. In addition, the average annual federal non-defense investment in public infrastructure has declined by roughly 30% from its level in the 60s and 70s to present day. Declining infrastructure investment could lead U.S. businesses and communities to miss out on and be slow to adapt to new technologies that provide critical advantages in assessing markets and delivering services more efficiently or widely. Infrastructure plays an enormous role in connecting Americans and American products to each other in the world, both physically and digitally. If we are going to maintain our economic competitiveness uh, in the world economy, it is critical that the National Infrastructure Bank be established to provide the needed resources to not only meet the growing need to upgrade and modernize and expand our infrastructure, but also to pay for the deferred uh, maintenance has not occurred over the past 50 years. So urge each of you to take this day of action, to reach out to your Congress representatives and senators, to urge them to support House Resolution 3339 to meet this critical need for infrastructure to maintain our economic competitiveness. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. All right, some of the questions that were dropped into the chat during um, the presentations. The first one was, uh, does this um, bill uh, add a profit motive to infrastructure projects? Who would like to answer that question? So I, let me take a, a shot at it. Um, this is a public bank. The purpose is to finance infrastructure projects and keep financing costs down to a mere, bare minimum. And in addition, uh, there is a big technical assistance component to the bank to help us uh, small districts who maybe don't have the uh, expertise in hand to uh, formulate uh, requests for loans or manage projects. So all of that is aimed at keeping costs down to a bare minimum. Uh, the projects that are financed, of course, would go out for competitive bids. And any profits of the National Infrastructure Bank actually this is not a profit, take, it's a public bank, it's not a profit taking bank. They would, uh, these profits would go into a trust fund that would then give grants to low income uh, districts that could not afford to take loans. So th the answer is uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't accentuate the profit motive any more than the competitive bidding process to bid on construction projects. I'll, I'll add something about how the RFC operated. What separated it from uh, the private sector, it offered long-term low interest loans, more so than any bank could offer a private uh, uh, concern or a municipality. And the loans were made so that they, they existed over long periods of times and just and any profits that were made from those loans were returned to the United States Treasury so that the um, RFC was self-sustaining. 
and its profits were used to fund the New Deal spending programs like the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration. So the monies were redirected. If there was a profit, they were used to fund the spending programs. The RFC was a lending program and that's what separated one from the other. And, and as well, I also wanna make a point about World War II because the RFC uh, built these massive plants to manufacture trucks, tanks, and airplanes that develop synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production. It owned 70% of the uh, aviation industry at the end of World War II and almost all of the rubber industry at the end of World War II. And it sold all of that to private industry at the end of the war, which was responsible for the industrial and middle-class expansion uh, that so many people enjoyed for many decades to come. And I mention this because I see the same possibilities with the new infrastructure bank. Thank you very much. Um, I believe you've answered this question, but Alfeca, if you could just uh, confirm it, does the bank balance get replenished continuously by the bonds? So for those folks that are interested, we have a write-up on how the bank makes and creates money. Uh, but the bottom line is that this is a, re a lending institution, as Stephen has said, so that means that it is essentially a revolving fund. Money is lent out and then it is paid back in and then it can be lent back out again. Uh, so altogether, uh, it is uh, a self-contained financing unit. But in the end, we expect that uh, with growth to the economy, uh, it'll spur the economy, it'll spur businesses, and um, it will be able to make its own way. Um, but it operates essentially just like a commercial bank, living off the difference between the loans that it that it acquires to get cash and the loans that it gives out um, that that spread is what it's living off of. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, today being a national day of action for this cause, um, there are many other opportunities besides this teaching to participate in it. Among the things that we want you to do is we want you to call your senators. We want you to ask them. Um, to and urge your member of Congress to co-sponsor HR 3339, the National Infrastructure Bill. Uh, the number is on your screen and the bill number is on your screen also. If you have not had contact with your, your state legislature, we ask you to reach out to them as well uh, with um, the information about the bill and ask if they'd be willing to advance a resolution. Um, I see Michael Goodman has a, his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a couple of very brief questions. First, I was wondering if a postal savings bank, if that could ever be reestablished, might be able to serve some of the functions as far as loans for reconstruction. My second question, even more specific, is um, have private toll roads, now that there's so many of them around today, have they served as a good source of revenue for uh, infrastructure rebuilding. Thanks. So who would like to address that? Is that you, Al Becca? Let me take the one on the, both of them actually. On the postal banking, uh, we had thought about that and we've all already talked with the Postal Service uh, Labor Union about the, the possibility. The great thing about postal banking is it opens financial centers in areas that don't, that are bank underserved. Uh, like inner city areas or rural areas that don't have uh, banks available. So uh, the, the bill as it sits now is streamlined. It's only for an infrastructure bank, but it's possible that Congress could add on a possibility to put a postal banking branch uh, and that people could keep their deposits in, uh, in the postal banking system that would, that would feed cash into the NIB to give out in loans. It's possible. Uh, it's a very uh, intriguing idea, and we're we're really interested in, in pursuing it. The second uh, question has to do with toll roads, and I think uh, Lisa Longo had also asked this question about privatization, uh, toll roads. Uh, a lot of people are interested in this. Uh, it's uh, received a lot of press lately in Pennsylvania, in Virginia, in Maryland. So uh, what I would say overall is the objective of the National Infrastructure Bank is to keep the ownership of public infrastructure public. 
We will take on public-private partnerships where they are appropriate, for example, to build an airport, um, new runways or things like that. But where uh, infrastructure is public, we wanna keep it in public hands. And the reason is as follows. What we've noticed, for example, most public-private partnership uh, have got in, tra- in the transportation area has gone into roads. And these are high traffic roads where a P3 company can make a lot of profits all off of the extra traffic on that road. But 65% of the nation's roads don't have enough traffic on them for a P3 even to be worth investing in. So that means that they would never get financing money. And then let's look at the uh, the outcome of P3 roads, which haven't, uh, and also P3 uh, transit uh, um, entities have not gone very well lately. In Virginia, where I live, we have a lot of P3 roads and they don't reduce traffic congestion. This is our biggest problem in Northern Virginia and why we're wasting a lot of fuel going into the air and CO2 is because nobody is solving the traffic congestion problem. To do that, we have to put more rail in the mix as opposed, instead of giving 80% of financing to roads and 20% to transit, let's flip it over the other way around and really accentuate the importance of mass transit for moving commuters and getting people off of the roads. If we electrify vehicles, we're still got, we still got traffic congestion altogether. Uh, This is a better idea for reformulating our transportation mix and P3 roads would not be something that we would accentuate or adding on new toll roads. No. Uh, I would like to comment on that too. In the state of Missouri, we did look at toll roads, but we also looked at the public private partnership when we were talking about the toll roads and a lot of the uh, legislators and also local governments decided not to go with the toll roads. The state of Missouri, as of two years ago, decided to go with a, a gas tax, which we did get passed, but it, it was a 20-year journey to get that gas tax passed in the state of Missouri. So in looking at, again, how to fund the infrastructure, it has been a big journey. So I just want to throw that in there. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Um, there was another question that asked, um, where can we access the write-up on the bill? Uh, if you go, if you go on to the, uh, there's a whole lot of information on the bill uh, on our website, nibcoalition.com. Um, you'll be able to look under um, things like a quick summary, which has linkages to the bill, uh, linkages to economic studies on the bill, a summary, a summary of what how the bill works, uh, how the uh, National Infrastructure Bank works. There's a lot of qualitative information on there. So we really uh, 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 suggest, as Alan has uh, suggested, not only to read the bill, it's a very simple bill, only 75 pages long, uh, but also read the quick summary and some of the bullet summaries on the bill. That'll give you a better flavor for how the bank actually works and how uh, local governments can take on loans. Thank you very much for both the question and the answer. Um, Would you please, Mark, go back to the slide that shows the other things that folks can do today? There is a call-in mechanism on the nibcoalition.com website. Also, there's copies of resolutions there that can be used if you want to advance a resolution in your own uh, locality. Um, We're asking for people to call their elected officials in Congress, also your state reps. And what's great is that the information that's on the website can be used to construct a really great op-ed. And we encourage everyone to write such uh, an op-ed or a letter to the editor in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. There will also be uh, radio interviews and call-ins to announce initiative and um, a GoFundMe account to donate to for supporting the continued efforts to get HR 3339, the National Infrastructure Bank Bill, through Congress. Do we have anyone, any of our speakers that would like to say anything to end up? I have my hand up, Carolyn. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I was wondering if between uh, Alfeca and maybe Stephen or whoever else, give everybody an idea of exactly Uh, what it would take to actually get this thing up and running. In other words, how long would it take to actually begin to do the work, implement the process, et cetera? Thank you. 
I could uh, offer a, a comment and then I'll let Stephen follow. The bill contains uh, features to allow it to get up and running quickly, an emergency provision to allow it to give out loans in its first year of operation. If we see that the bank looks like it's going to be passed, we'll already be collecting the long list of backlog projects in each state that need to be worked on that are not getting funded through local uh, um, uh, budgets. And uh, then we'll also set up a contacts with states, with one-stop shops for information uh, projects to be given out for uh, local area governments to apply for money for projects. Uh, and then we can give out, just like the RFC did, uh, we can give out loans in the first year of operation. Our aim is to give out about $500 billion worth of loans each year over its 10, over 10 year period. And what I can add to that is that look at the Reconstruction Finance Corporation as a model. The RFC made loans to every congressional district in the United States of America. It was established by a Republican president. It was embraced by Republicans, Democrats, liberals, and conservatives throughout the Great Depression and World War II. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, the United States military ranked 17th in the world in 1939, and within a matter of months, it was poised to become the arsenal of democracy because Congress acted and passed legislation that allowed the RFC to go into action to militarize the industry so we could fight and win World War II. Same thing with the Great Depression. It was started by Hubert Hoover. He did everything he possibly could within his own limits to uh, make it work, but it was just too little too late. So FDR took it, he supercharged it, and the RFC took off. The first thing it did was stabilize the bank by buying st preferred stock in them, just like TARP did in 2008. It saved the economy, it stabilized the banks and allowed credit to flow through the economy. If the banks didn't do it, the RFC did it and they were immediate about it. They built everything that we talked about today, the RFC did it in some form or another. It financed the development of high-speed trains. It built roads, bridges, tunnels, aqueducts. It did everything that we want a new infrastructure bank to do today. And all I can say is look at the RFC as a model. It was embraced by almost everybody. And hopefully a new infrastructure bank will be done like that today. And as one of our speakers said, it's patriotic. I mean, it would be a wonderful thing for us to embrace the power of good government for the good of everybody. Thank you, thank you. Um, in the time you were answering, another question uh, ended up in the chat. That question is, is there an explanation page about the cost? Would this not add 2% annual cost to bond redemptions that funded the bank? And would that be tax-free? Would this not be an added burden taxpayers pay for bonds? The, the National Infrastructure Bank can issue its own bonds as part of its uh, financing in order to bring in cash to clear checks out of the deposits that it creates when it, when it uh, enacts loans. Uh, this has to do with the circulation theory of how banks actually make money. So I'll ask uh, um, our communications director to put that, since we get a lot of questions on how the NIB makes and creates money, uh, how it covers the, two, the extra 2% on the, uh, the capitalization side. Uh, is there enough money for everything else? Um, I'll have her put that um, piece onto the website, how, how the NIB makes and creates money. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. And I'm going to say this brings us to a conclusion for today. If you can repost the slide with the um, number for Congress, it's the number to the switchboard. You can call it and they will transfer you to whoever your representative or senator is. It's HR3339 and we're asking you to place calls to your member of Congress. And here is a list of those who are, I believe this is the committee that is considering HR 3339 right now. And so if you would focus on these folks, if you live in their jurisdiction, that would be awesome. Really appreciate it. Um, 
Also, don't forget to go to the NIB website to look at the additional actions you can take today and information that you can use to write an op-ed or a letter to the editor. Um, we would really appreciate that. And I want to thank all of our speakers um, today. They were fantastic, um, always informative. I learned something new every time I'm in one of these meetings. And thank you to the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.